welcome members to our meeting today and just to confirm that we have a quorum and we have joining us on Starleaf Catherine Kelly and Sinead Bradley and Rosemary Barton, Gary Middleton and Morris Bradley. Thank you. Can I just remind you if you want to ask questions just use the hand raise facility on your Starleaf. And can I remind members just to put your any devices on our plane mode, please. So today we have apologies from Tom Buchanan and John O'Dowd. And do we have any delegated proxy votes? Yes, Chair. Uh, Tom Buchanan has delegated his vote to Gary Middleton for today. Okay, thank you. So Agenda item two then is our draft minutes of our previous meeting. The draft minutes of the 30th of September 2020 are at page five. Are members content to agree the draft minutes? Yep. I'm always going to take silence as, as contentment. <laughs> Agenda item three then matters arising. So members, you'll be aware that the committee's motion to amend Stanton Order 45A was agreed yesterday in the assembly. And that was part of the NDNA agreement to allow a party to go into opposition up to two years following the formation of the executive. So whilst I know there were some concerns about delays in, in this item coming, I think that we have shown some leadership as a committee that at least we are coming to the chamber with the, our NDNA commitments. And there are a number of other issues that we can be looking to in the future to, again, if others don't step up to the plate, to show some leadership and move on with. Um, so agenda item four then, members, are the legislative consent motions. You'll recall that we agreed to take, undertake an inquiry into the procedure for LCMs and the committee wrote to all parties and independent members to seek their views and agreed to commission research. However, as many other things, it was put on hold due to the pandemic and we have now written again to all parties and independent members and expect responses by the 23rd of October. So would just like to remind members that, that those responses are expected and it would be good to have as many responses to that as, as we possibly can. So today we'll be receiving a briefing from Assembly Research and you'll go to page 12 of your pack and you'll see a cover note from the clerk and page 16, the research paper from Ray's. We're joined on Starleaf by Emma, I think. Do I see Emma? There she is. Yeah, that's great. Emma Delo Perry from the Assembly Research Team and just want to welcome Emma to our meeting here today and I'm going to allow you to go ahead. Just to say, Emma, it was a very detailed briefing and very helpful, as I, as I said just before the meeting started, to, to myself. So I want to thank you for the detailed briefing that you've given. Members may have questions, obviously you want to give some of the, the highlights of it, but it is very detailed and members hopefully will have, have read it and will have questions in relation to it. So I'll let you go ahead and, and give your, your brief outline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, just as a, to start us off at the beginning, legislative consent motions are mechanisms which allow devolved legislatures to consent to primary legislation emanating from the UK Parliament and dealing with the matter of devolved competence. They're a function of the Sewell Convention, which states that the Westminster Parliament would not normally legislate for a devolved legislature without their consent. And it's generally understood to apply to primary legislation, not subordinate legislation. So, broadly speaking, before the EU Withdrawal Act, a legislative consent motion was relatively uncontroversial, although there have been some circumstances in which they were refused, and those are detailed in the packs, and we'll come to them in a bit. Uh, there was a change following the, the UK's exit from the EU. They're now of greater importance politically, but of course they're constitutional and their legal status has not changed, as was recently reaffirmed in Miller No. 1. So the EU Withdrawal Act itself created new processes to allow Westminster to legislate for uh, devolved administrations again, this time by SI. These are described as consent decisions, and although they are SIs, according to the legislation, they can't be made 
the sorry the the SIs can't be passed without consent. The consent decisions themselves are quite different in that a consent decision is when a devolved legislature either grants consent, refuses consent, or fails to pass a motion doing either within a time frame of 40 days. So the Senate and the Scottish Parliament have amended their SOs to allow for scrutiny of subordinate legislation which is made under these powers. The NI Assembly does not as yet have codified procedures. Now, the, there were four specific issues that were raised in the request. The first was the process and procedure for LCMs and other devolved legislatures. Their use in the past, and when giving consent, at what part? At what, sorry, at what point does that power come back to the assembly? Finally, we were asked for some information on the deliberations at Westminster on their understanding of the LCM. So. To start with the process and procedure for LCMs in other devolved legislatures, broadly speaking, the procedure is very similar. You start with the legislative consent memorandum, the report to committee, the committee reports back, and then it's voted upon. There are, and all the legislatures have roughly that same process in place. There are some subtle differences. So for example, uh, in Northern Ireland, the, the bill will automatically stand referred to a committee, whereas in Scotland and in the Senate, um, it can be given to a particular committee. And this allows for, say, when a bill covers more than, covers areas in which more than one committee might have an interest, it allows for the, say, the Parliamentary Bureau to designate a lead committee and allow them to sort of synthesize the work of several committees and bring it into to one final report. Similarly, in Wales, um, the, the business committee can schedule how long the, the committee will have to report back, rather than, say, it being 15 days or 10 days as laid out in the SOs. And similarly, the Senate and the Scottish Parliament have procedures which allow uh, if a, so, if a member does, if a member wishes to raise a legislative consent memorandum, they can do so in the Senate and in the Scottish Parliament. But in the Scottish Parliament, if you want to make to bring the matter to a vote, then you have to be the one who's lodged the memorandum, and usually that happens once the the time for the minister to lodge a, mem a memorandum has run out. Um, and to be clear, the memorandum is how the motion is lodged. So it starts with a legislative consent memorandum, and then it goes on to a legislative consent motion. Um, so those would be the principal differences, but broadly speaking, it's the same process with just a few variations in practice and procedures. I, I suppose the, the main takeaway is that the, the Senate and the Scottish Parliament have more detailed steps in between, whereas the Northern Ireland Assembly, it tends to be a bit more automatic. So in terms of the use of legislative consent motions, broadly speaking, uncontroversial, I think they're about 15 times before the EU Withdrawal Act that they were refused, and this was usually done by the Senate. Um, it seems to be, that seems to be related to the devolution settlement that's in place in Wales because that was enumerated powers rather than the reserved powers model that we operate on and operates in Scotland. But the example I like to, to go to is the, uh, is the agriculture bill that was passed in Wales. So if you compare that with, I'll explain it both, but if you, the, the reason I like to look at it is because compared with the Miller decision, it delineates quite nicely the extent of the convention. So essentially, the UK government wanted to pass the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill, which can contain provisions relating to agricultural wages. The Welsh Assembly, as it then was, didn't want to provide consent to that and considered that agricultural wages fell within agriculture which meant that it was devolved to them. So they didn't consent. The UK government went ahead and passed the legislation and the 
Welsh, the Welsh Senate then passed legislation which contradicted what the UK government had done in the Enterprise Bill. When that happened, the Attorney General referred the matter to the Supreme Court, which has powers to hear uh, the powers to consider the VRAs of devolved legislatures under practice direction 10. So the issue then went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court considered that agricultural wages did fall within the defini definition of agriculture, and therefore the Welsh Bill stood, and the UK government didn't take it any further. But if you contrast that with the decision in Miller, that was about the Sewell Convention. And the question there was whether the Sewell Convention would prevent the UK government from legislating in the absence of consent. And the Supreme Court said, well, because it's the Sewell Convention, it's an element of parliamentary activity. It's an element of parliamentary proceedings. And we, as a, as a court, can't rule on that. So that's the sort of either end of the scale in terms of legislative consent motions. But there are more details on that in section 7A of your briefing. So to move on to return of powers where consent has been given, I interpreted that question as being about the section 12 regulation or the section 12 provisions in the Withdrawal Act. Um, so that <clears throat> those are known as the freezing regulation. Basically what happens there is those, the, those provisions give the UK government powers to freeze devolved competence in a particular area once that happens, the freezing, the freezing of devolved competence can happen now, and it will be possible for devolved competence to be frozen for another two years from the date, of, from the end of the, trans, the transition period, so from 31st December 2020 for another two years. Once power has been frozen, it can remain frozen for up to five years, but that depends on the provisions of the particular exercise of that power. So a minister may decide to freeze it for three years or four years or two, but up to five is the maximum. Once legislation is made under that power, it will remain in place until it is either repealed by the UK government or until the Northern Ireland Assembly passes legislation which countermands it, and that legislation is not subject to challenge in the Supreme Court by Attorney General referral. Um, so in terms of the Westminster view of the Sewell Convention, the Sewell Convention is well documented in terms of parliamentary sovereignty. Legislative consent motions do not appear in the standing orders of either the House of Lords or the House of Parliament, or the House of Commons, sorry. They're seen as matters for the devolved administrations. So they're not really uh, referred to in the UK Parliament at all. When an LCM is published, it's usually published alongside the bill and it's indicated in the order of business. Where consent is refused, this has been noted. Some committees have made reference to this. Uh, the Scottish Affairs Committee, for example, has made recommendations about how LCMs could be better brought to the attention of MPs, for example, through tagging bills. And the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee has called for greater cooperation between parliaments on this issue and has noted that the ambiguous and unsettled nature of the Sewell Convention has allowed for more disputes in this area and recommended that the government set out a clear uh, indication of the circumstances in which it would legislate in areas of devolved competence. But to my knowledge, that hasn't happened yet. Um, <clears throat> so as a brief summary, legislative consent motions, very much a matter for uh, individual devolved legislatures. They, there are some differences in practice and procedure in terms of uh, LCMs for primary legislation, but broadly they all follow the same pattern. Uh, following the Withdrawal Acts, it's possible that devolved competence will be impacted by SI, statutory instrument, and as things stand at the minute, there's no codified procedure in the Assembly for 
dealing with that particular, uh, with, with granting consent in that particular circumstance, whereas the Senate and the Scottish Parliament do have procedures in place, and those are at Appendix Four and Five of your uh, briefing of the briefing paper. I'm not sure what page it is in your packs. So, sorry if that was too quick, but I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you very much, Emma. Appreciate that. And I'm going to open it up to members to ask any questions that they have. Cherry, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Emma. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Th thanks for that. Uh, listen to two questions. One of them you might not be able to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I suppose what is the, I would be uh, interested to hear even the government's sort of democratic rationale for, for using LCMs, because if I have understand, understood you correctly and, and the presentation, um, that obviously it's over uh, devolved issues that they can in, initiate essentially legislation uh, to be discussed on uh, an assembly floor. But if those items are devolved, then what's the rationale for, for, um, for them? Uh, I suppose that's a basic question, but that, uh, and to me, it smacks of, uh, you know, ignoring or dismissing maybe local concerns or, or views or, or, or however you want to frame it. So that's the, the first um, question. Second question is, I suppose, a more technical question in terms of um, you give the examples mostly in Wales about the refusals to introduce or to support whatever it is, the LCMs. Uh, in, in regards to here, just as, as a matter of clarification, is it the particular minister whose that area is um, responsible for has the uh, authority to decline to bring an LCM through? Or is it the executive as a whole? Or could you maybe detail uh, in the likelihood of an LCM not being uh, agreed to be brought to the floor of Stormont here? How, who would say that, if that makes sense? Um, that's an interesting question. So in terms of your first question, I'll, I'll just say that the, the Sewell Convention is designed for circumstances in which the UK government consider it to be more convenient to legislate for the UK as a whole. But I can't go any further than that. Um, the the second question. So, the legislative consent memorandum has always been brought by the minister responsible, um, and the motion has always been voted upon by the assembly. Uh, I, I've never seen it occur that the. Certainly, as far as Northern Ireland goes, I've never seen it occur that the that the responsible minister wouldn't bring the matter forward. Um, but I, I suppose I could be wrong in that. I could go and, I, I could go and check in more detail. But, but in theory, sorry, they probably could. In theory, you'd you'd, you'd imagine that they probably could. In theory, to say not to. Uh, yes, in theory, and um, certainly. Under the EU Withdrawal Act, the time could lapse, hmm. um, and, and that's anticipated in the legislation. But yes, in theory, um, that could happen. Although under the Assembly uh, provisions, a member may bring a legislative consent memorandum forward when uh, a minister doesn't. Hmm. However, there's no uh, <laughs> there's no specific provision for them to then bring that matter to a vote if that makes sense. So, so they can lodge the memorandum, but not necessarily bring the matter to a vote. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Emma. And just, I suppose, to clarify for your, yourself, Jerry, I know that this was something that I was concerned with when I first came into Assembly, because one of my first roles was around yeah. legacy and the Stormont House Agreement was going to require an LCM. Um, mm. And it, it, it is voted on in the Assembly. Everybody gets the opportunity to, to vote. But you're right, the Minister can refuse mm. to bring it forward. Um, Take so, Chair. Check. Do any other members have questions? Is anybody in Can't see anyone concern? now. Oh, there we go. Who's that? That's Rosemary, is it? Rosemary. Gary. So. Rosemary's taking her hand down, actually, maybe. Gary? No, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Rosemary, go ahead. Yeah, if, if the minister refuses to bring it forward, where do you go from? Where do you go to? So, a member may choose to do so. Okay. 
If the minister refuses, then a member can. Can go ahead, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great. Okay. Gary, you were looking in there as well. You're on mute, Gary. No, thanks, Chair. I was just waiting to... Uh, they, they disabled the button there, so I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, maybe that was deliberate, I don't know. Um, but what I do want to say, look, I, I don't have any specific questions. <laughs> I don't have any specific questions. I just want to thank Emma uh, for the um, the presentation because it was uh, it was actually quite uh, detailed and the briefing paper is actually excellent. So uh, I know that it's important now that we get all the responses in uh, before the 23rd of October, uh, LCMs are obviously going to play a very important role uh, going forward. So uh, it's important that we get that right. So, no, it was really just a thank you, Emma, for, for that presentation. It was very useful indeed. I know that as a party, we'll be uh, no, but no doubt providing a response as well to all of this. So thank you. A pleasure. Thanks, Gary. Just want to ensure that no other members are looking in before that Emma go. Chair, you... You have everything answered that you... Yeah, have. thanks, Chair. Thanks, no yeah, yeah. Emma, just on, on my own behalf, and it's more of a comment rather than a question, I, I appreciate the briefing paper because it'll be helpful to the parties in responding and to the, to the individuals, the independents who respond to it as well. I think that that's, that's really where it's going to be... You're really going to get the value out of it, so really do appreciate it. Um, and I suppose to say a comment from my own point of view, I'm not keen about like Jay, I'm not keen on LCMs. They removed the opportunity for committee scrutiny. Um, and it's legislation that we didn't actually make ourselves and, and that's that concerns me in, in any circumstance. So I would agree with Jerry in, in relation to that. I do accept that there are some circumstances in which we we do it because it's technical and it's minor. But where there are significant impacts here, I think without committee scrutiny, we really leave ourselves open to well to criticism, and rightly so that w that we are not creating that legislation ourselves. That that's best for here, and I think we have shown even if you look at thing recent pieces of legislation, for example, the domestic abuse bill, um, and we could have just lifted Westminster's and and you know did the did the LCM on that or. or looked at how we could extend it to here, but the committee felt very strongly that wasn't the right way to go forward, and so did the those who were impacted, you know, the, the groups and organisations that were speaking up for those affected by domestic abuse. So I think it is important that we make legislation for here, by the people here, for the people here, and that's, that's I suppose, where I would, would be my starting point. But thank you very much for, for doing that briefing paper. Appreciate it. Thank you, Emma. All right. And just to remind members again, then it's the 23rd of October is the date for responses into that, and um, we will consider those then at our next meeting, which will be the 4th of November. Am I right, Ms. Yes, that's because we have recess week. We would have been meeting on the 28th, but it's recess, so it's the following week. Yeah. Okay. So, just to make members aware that um, I've been made aware that our counterpart committee in the House of Commons is undertaking an inquiry into the ways which the procedures of the House of Commons engage with the um, territorial constitution. This includes steps required to facilitate greater joint working between committees of each of the devolved legislatures and committees of the House of Commons. For purposes including shared scrutiny of intergovernmental working on policy areas of common interest based on the responses this committee receives in its inquiry, inquiry, I would suggest that the committee provides a submission to the House of Commons Procedures Committee and that the clerk brings a draft response for the committee's consideration to the next meeting. Are members content that we do that? Agreed. Very good. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Agenda item five then is correspondence and in your tabled items you'll see a memo from the senior assistant clerk of the audit committee in respect of the committee's temporary provisions in Stanton Order 110 to 116. The audit committee has asked whether consideration has been given to allowing remote attendance at plenary hearings. 
Are members content that the clerk respond to the audit committee, informing them that the committee previously wrote to the chief executive on this issue? And members will recall this from a previous meeting that the chief executive confirmed that if the committee agreed to amend Stanton orders to introduce hybrid proceedings, then further investment in infrastructure would be required and be brought to the attention of the Assembly Commission. Therefore, the committee is not minded to amend the Stanton orders at this stage, but would do so should the Assembly agree to introduce hybrid proceedings. So really what we're saying is we won't do it until we know that there's going to be value in it, that the investment is actually going to happen. Um, there's little value in amending standing orders if they, if they can't actually take place practically. So are members content that that's how we move forward? Yeah. Like that is a yes. Yeah. And further correspondence yeah. then at pages 91 to 94 of your pack, are members content to note these items? Yeah, content. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Agenda item six then is our forward work programme. And we're expecting responses from parties and independent members on the number of issues that are due over the next couple of weeks. Those include our statements in the chamber, the LCMs and the proxy voting. And as this is our last meeting before Halloween research, recess, we can consider those responses at the next meeting, which is due on the 4th of November. Okay, members content with that? Hmm? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no chair I'll just answer for you. And there's no chairperson's business. Do any members have any other issues that they want to raise? Uh, Sinead got a I think Sinead. Sinead. Yes, thanks, Chair. It was only um, going back to that, um, you know, if we're reaching out to other stakeholders, not just the parties, about LCMs, I'm not sure how we communicated with those stakeholders initially, and is it worthy just sent a wee reminder out at this stage? Yes, Sinead. It, it was a... Rem yes, Sinead, it was, it was a reminder sent out. So this was previously... Um, Previous work that was previously carried out in terms of asking for responses to this, so there was a reminder sent out, and that was sent out. Was that four weeks ago? Yes. Yeah, four weeks ago, Shanine. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, everybody else content? Hmm? So, hmm. as there's no other business, we'll. Uh, Gary, were you looking in? No. No, I'm more than content. Thank you. Okay. And. So our next meeting then will be on Wednesday the 4th of November at 2 o'clock in this room 29. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 29.